<sighs> of course, I didn't shut my phone off when I... Yeah. Phone call? Yeah. Somebody was calling me while I was playing. Couldn't hear it on the phone. Did you hear it? Not good. So anyways, yeah, so... Anyways, uh, <laughs> good evening. Glad you couldn't hear it. And uh, uh, could you turn your Bible? Uh, we don't have to turn to our Bibles anywhere, actually, because we're continuing our study of the history of the English Bible. Uh, we're going to be uh, noting uh, this evening the Bibles of Coverdale, Matthew, uh, the Great Bible, the Geneva Bible. Actually, I have a copy of the Geneva Bible here, and I was showing it to Titus and the kids a few moments ago. And the, the English, the old English is it's like, what English is this? <laughs> it's pretty funny. So uh, we're also going to note the Bishop's Bible, what that is, and also the Rames, uh, the, uh, the Rames Dewey Bible, Dewey Bible. And uh, that version, we'll be noting all these uh, Bibles that, took, uh, that were, uh, came about uh, before the advent of the King James, which we'll be noting tomorrow evening. And uh, as I see, uh, we've got this uh, new, um, I don't know what we can call it, but uh, we have this new uh, program that's going to eventually replace uh, Pal Talk, and this is something, a, a dream that Titus has had for years to get rid of Pal Talk, and the reason why, me too, is because uh, Pal Talk is so unstable, and so with this new program, uh, we can go right to, right to our, uh, our, ser- our own website, you can go right to our own website, and uh, it's working off our server, and our server is a lot more stable than the servers of Pal Talk, so we won't have this problem that we have uh, intermittently. Uh, with Pal Talk, where it goes down for whatever reason, and they have some problems or difficulties, we won't be affected by that anymore. I mean, if we do go down, that means something wrong. That means something's going wrong with the server. So we don't. We uh, we have a, a a great server. So thank God for that. So um, glad to see that uh, Alice and George are are on, and I'm sure we'll be seeing the Fletches. Uh, I think Mike's working to, uh, tonight, and so uh, we're going to uh, be using that. We're just going to roll that out and try to. We want to make sure our regulars on Pal Talk are comfortable getting in and out of that. So we'll probably run this thing uh, conjunct- in conjunction. We'll, have, we'll keep running Pal Talk for a couple of weeks or so until everybody's comfortable with this new system. So uh, we'll, s- we'll see how it goes. And I mean, uh, ultimately, the plan is to get rid of Pal Talk because it's so unstable. I think you'll, once we get used to this new one, it'll be, uh, it'll be great. I was on it the other night with Mike Fletcher and, uh, and um, Titus and uh, monkeying around, weighing the, uh, the the benefits of the thing, and see, uh, I think it's really, I think it's really good. I think it's better than Pal Talk myself. So, anyways, I hope that I pray, keep that in prayer. Hope that works out well, and hope everything uh, for everybody on, uh, that was our Pal Talk listeners that are on there now to this new program. Uh, what are we going to call this new program, anyways, Titus? The Thompson, the Thompson Room, we can call it, or something like that. Let's call it the Thompson Room. Yeah, yeah I like that one. It's pretty good. So, anyways, he won't like that one. All right, uh, so let's uh, let's get underway. We got a, we got a, uh, some ground here to cover here this evening, and uh, this will be our third hour of a seven-part series on the history of the English Bible. So, without further ado, let's take a moment of silent prayer to examine ourselves to determine if we need to confess any sins to the Father. This restores our fellowship with God. The filling of the Spirit, which is maintained by continuing to uh, obey the Holy Spirit as he speaks to us through the teaching of the Word of God. That's when we're obeying the command of Ephesians 5.18 to be filled with the Spirit, which of course is synonymous with Colossians 3.16, to let the Word of Christ richly dwell in your soul. There's two reasons for that, why they're synonymous. One, if you look at both passages, they bear the same results. And number two, the Holy Spirit has inspired the Scriptures according to 2 Peter 1.20 and 21. So therefore, the, the Holy Spirit is speaking to us through the teaching of the Word of God this evening. And uh, I'm to be his instrument, so I also have to make sure that I'm in fellowship with God as well. So with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you have given to us so graciously. Another day to gather together with other members of the body of Christ, to study your word, and uh, particularly this evening to study the history of the English Bible. 
And we just thank you for the men that have given their lives so that we could have these, the Bible in our own language, the English language. And of course, in our day and age, we have so many different translations. Um, the accomplishment of great scholars that the church has. And we just thank you, Father, for the translations that, English translations that we have in front of us. And we pray, Father, that we would never get uh, familiar with the fact of the great blessings that we have the greatest blessing of having your word and to study your plan, to learn of who and what you are and who what your son is in the spirit and what you've done for us in the past through both your son and the spirit and do for us now through both of them. Uh, we just thank you, Father, for the truths that we're learning in the Bible and we pray that you would guide us in this study of the history of the English Bible. We pray that it would be a great blessing to your people. We pray that you, your people will be built up and edified by what they learn and also you and your son, Jesus Christ, would be glorified. We pray you would help Titus with the sound and the recordings, the video, the audio, and we thank you for this new program that we pray that would uh, supplant and replace uh, Pal Talk and would be better than that. And uh, we just pray, Father, that uh, everyone would enjoy themselves here this evening. We'd have no technical problems. And we just uh, thank you for another day of studying your word. So, Father, we pray for these things in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. As we noted in the first uh, hour of our study of this uh, topic of the history of the English Bible. We saw that uh, the morning star of the Reformation, John, uh, uh, we, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Wycliffe, uh, we see that uh, we have uh, William Tyndale last evening, we know it, but John Wycliffe, excuse me. John Wycliffe was the man, the morning star of the Reformation. His name's pronounced by many in America, of course, Wycliffe, but I use the pronunciation that the Brits use, I think. And uh, John Wycliffe is the morning star of the Reformation. And he is the first uh, man who has uh, attempted to get the, the Bible out into the English language. Uh, he actually based his translation on the Latin Vulgate, which was the production of Jerome, one of the church's great scholars, uh, who was a Hebrew and Greek scholar, and he lived. He, his translation of the Latin Vulgate was completed around approximately 400 A.D. And, of course, uh, Wycliffe's translation of the Bible was based upon the text of the, of the uh, the Latin Vulgate. Of course, Wycliffe comes on. Uh, Wycliffe is followed by William Tyndale, and Tyndale was the first one. He actually his translation was based upon the original Hebrew and Greek text. He was actually a Hebrew and Greek scholar. Uh, he was uh, he had his masters uh, at uh, Oxford before he was the age of twenty. Uh, he studied also at Cambridge. He was fluent in several different six or seven different languages, and he was also brilliant in English. And uh, his uh, his um, uh, particular translation, Influ as we'll see as we go through this history of the English Bible, go, go all the way to the end, we'll see his translation uh, is actually influenced uh, Bible translation for uh, for the next 300 years. It would uh, influence Bible translation. It was a great influence of the King James. And uh, many have done, uh, as we saw last evening, uh, nine-tenths of the King James is actually uh, Wick, uh, uh, William Tyndale's uh, uh, creation. So uh, we see that Tyndale was, was a great, great translator, great, great scholar. We talked about him last evening. Uh, John Wycliffe, he, he, didn't, uh, he died of natural causes, uh, but William Tyndale did not. He was uh, uh, captured, he was, uh, he was arrested, and he was put to death. Uh, for heresy, and he was uh, com uh, he was accused of uh, corrupting the Bible. When in reality, he actually uh, created a beautiful translation that would affect Bible translators' uh, translation of the Bible for centuries to come. And uh, so uh, we see here that after uh, Tyndale's death, uh, uh, we saw that uh, not only was Tyndale actually was. Uh, Ex uh, executed for trying to translate the Bible, but also the Lollards. Uh, Cheyenne was asking me about them. The Lollards were actually uh, followed in the footsteps of John Wycliffe, and they were like Wycliffe. Uh, they were poor uh, Oxford scholars, poor young Oxford scholars, and they were translating the Bible, and they were executed, many of them, uh, for translating the Bible. And then came uh, William Tyndale, and of course, uh, he was uh, executed as well for translating the Bible into English. Uh, but then we saw that uh, just as he was speaking uh, his prayer to the father, William Tyndale, as he was being executed, uh, Lord, open the eyes of the king of England. Well, this was actually taking place as he was speaking. And so uh, we see that uh, uh, eventually we see that uh, the, the Bible was out there in English, but with the approval of the king of England. Now, in 1535, an assistant of Tyndale, who was named, who was named uh, his name was Miles Coverdale, an assistant of Tyndale in 1535, his name was Miles Coverdale, Coverdale. he translated the entire Bible into English. Now, remember, 
Uh, you might say, well, didn't Tyndale do that? Well, Tyndale didn't finish the Old Testament. He had the New Testament done. He was in the process of completing the Old Testament, but he was captured, uh, he was arrested, and he was executed before he could complete it. So we see that Miles Coverdale, who was T Tyndale's assistant in 1535, he translated the entire Bible into English. Now, he did not, however, translate from the Greek and Hebrew, but did use Luther's German translation, which was excellent. More than one Latin text he also used, and portions of Tyndale's Old Testament he used. His was the first complete Bible printed in English. Remember, uh, Tyndale only got to publish the New Testament. Now, it was, in fact, Coverdale's translation that Henry VIII had already permitted to be printed when Tyndale spoke his dying words, Lord, open the eyes of the King of, uh, King of England. And, uh, of course, this was Coverdale's translation was the answer to this prayer. So it was, in fact, Coverdale's translation that Henry VIII had already permitted to be printed when Tyndale spoke his dying words. Now, Coverdale's Bible placed the Apocrypha at the end of the Old Testament rather than putting these books throughout the Old Testament. The Apocrypha contained books which were not considered as canonical by the Protestants, but were accepted as canonical by the Catholics. Previous Old Testament translations had the Apocrypha distributed throughout the Old Testament. All Protestant Bibles uh, that would follow the Coverdale Bible included the Apocrypha as an appendix, if they included it at all. So this created a great furor in the uh, Catholic Church and everything. Uh, there were many who still believed, the, like the Catholic Church, that the Apocrypha was inspired by God. But you and I, Apoc uh, Protestants, and when I say, when I use the term Protestant, I mean uh, in contrast to the Catholics, the Protestants believe that the Bible is the final authority uh, uh, for the Christian, not the the, the church or the, or the pope or the, the, cardinal, the college of cardinals. So that would mean evangelical Christianity would fall under the heading of Protestantism. So, uh, of course, it, that name comes about because of Luther's protest against the Catholic Church. He got saved by reading his Greek New Testament and Romans, and he realized he, he issued uh, 95 complaints against the church a uh, uh, Roman Catholic Church and put them on the church, Roman Catholic Church in Wittenberg, Germany, 95 complaints against the Catholic Church, which are based upon the fact that the church was doing things that were not in the, taught in the original languages of Scripture. Thus, we have uh, Martin Luther's complaint. So we would fall under the, the title of Protestantism. Well, the Apocrypha, uh, Catholics would cons uh, have it in their Bibles. If you look at it, a Jerusalem Bible or something today, uh, they, have, they have the Apocrypha uh, in there, uh, but uh, and they have it in the between the Old and the New Testament, and then you have like there's the new, the new, most Protestant Bibles don't include it at all because we don't believe like the early ch the church in the first three centuries that the Apocrypha was in, 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 uh, inspired by God. And when we study canonicity, which is following this study, we'll talk about the Apocrypha in detail as to why it's not considered a part of the canon of Scripture. So uh, we see that the Apocrypha, we had, uh, for instance, in the Apocrypha, uh, we have uh, First and Second Maccabees, the Wisdom of Solomon. Uh, these were books that uh, were not considered a part by the church as part of the canon of Scripture. So we see that... Uh, this created a furor among many people, and uh, because for the first time it was not really included. So in, uh, we see that all Protestant Bibles that would follow the Coverdale Bible included the Apocrypha as an Apocrypha as an appendix, if they included it at all. I think the New Revised Standard Version has the Apocrypha in it. And so uh, in 1537, we see that Matthew's Bible was produced by a man named John Rogers, whose name was Thomas Matthew. He took Coverdale's Old Testament and combined it with uh, Tyndale's New Testament, so that which is quite interesting. So Rogers also had uh, included two thousand notes, many of which which were controversial, which I'll note in a minute. So you had uh, after Tyndale, first you had you had Wycliffe, then you had Tyndale. And before the advent of the King James, there were several Bibles that came on the scene. We just noted the first, the Bible done by Coverdale. And then we now we have, we're talking about Matthew's Bible. And Matthew's Bible was produced by a man named John Rogers, whose pen name was Thomas Matthew. Thus the name for this Bible, Matthew's Bible. Matt, uh, we see that uh, uh, this man, John Rogers, whose pen name was Thomas Matthew, he took Coverdale's Old Testament and combined it with Tyndale's New Testament. He also included 2,000 notes, many of which 
were controversial. And let me bring out one of them that was one of the most controversial. And I think you'll you'll get a, you'll crack up. And it's not meant to be. Uh, you know, I, I don't mean to laugh at the what it's saying, but it's funny because it's in the it's in this translation. It was a, a actually a typo. It was actually a, an error in printing. Uh, this Bible is called this Bible that Ma it's called Matthew's Bible. Uh, it included two thousand notes, as I said before. And it was called by some people the wife beater's Bible. That's right. It was called by some people the wife beater's Bible because the marginal note at 1 Peter 3, 7 says, if the wife be not obedient and helpful unto her husband, he endeavoreth to beat the fear of God into her. <laughs> Sorry for that, laughing. It just sounds so ridiculous. Of course, wife beating is terrible. It's wrong. But it's just comical that it was actually uh, nobody saw this is ridiculous so it's, it said if the wife be not obedient and helpful unto her husband he endeavoreth to beat the fear of god into her so that's why it was called the wife beater's bible because this this particular note was in there now ff uh, F. bruce who was a great scholar he attributes this to the bible by bishop beck uh, he doesn't attribute it to matthew now in 15 55, Rogers, uh, Thomas Matthew, would become the first martyr to be burned at the stake by the Catholic ruler, uh, Me Mary Tudor, uh, whose, first, whose nickname was Bloody Mary. Ever hear of the drink Bloody Mary? Well, Bloody Mary actually is talking about uh, a queen uh, her, whose name was Mary Tudor. And uh, I don't believe Rogers was uh, executed for this wife beater's statement. Uh, the, it wasn't his fault. It was an editor. It was a printer's mistake uh, in the marginal note. So uh, he was executed. He was the first martyr to be burned at the stake by a Catholic rule, rule, the Catholic ruler, Mary Tudor. Of course, we already know Tyndale got executed in the Lollards. But uh, this was Mary's the first, Mary is the one who executed this guy. Uh, she was that was the first person that she executed for translated translating the Bible. She had the nickname Bloody Mary. Now uh, Bruce Metzger, who as I quoted from last evening, uh, he's one of the great scholars, as I said before, that the church has uh, ever had. Uh, he was around the 20th century. He died in, early in the 21st century. Uh, he's one of the great men of, that uh, have that done a lot for the advancement of textual criticism. And uh, the history of the Bible, he's done a lot. He's just a great scholar, and he's one of those men I really respect. And uh, he has the following quote, and it's in his book, The Bible in Translation, Ancient and English Versions, pages 61 and 62. He writes, although the title page of the 1537 Bible identifies the translator as Thomas Matthew, there is reason to think that this was a pseudonym intended to veil the identity of the real translator. The work is generally attributed to a man named John Rogers, a Cambridge graduate and friend of Tyndale. He had come into possession of some of Tyndale's unpublished translations of several Old Testament books. Published perhaps at Antwerp, the translation follows closely the Tyndale version. A new preface was provided for the Apocrypha, and as in Coverdale's Bible, the books of the Apocrypha were placed by themselves in an appendix to the Old Testament at the end of the Old Testament. The Matthew Bible had, for the first time in English, a translation of the apocryphal prayer of Manasseh rendered from the French Olivetan's Bible. During Edward VI's short reign, Rogers was in favor and gave London preferments, given, and given London preferments, and immediately after the king's death, he preached at St. Paul's Cross, warning the people against popery, the Pope. By January 1554, after Mary had established her claim to the throne, Rogers was in prison, and in February 1555, he was burned alive at Smithfield, the first of the Protestant martyrs. The French ambassador wrote that Rogers died with such composure that it might have been a wedding. Imagine that. He was burned alive, but they said he had such composure that you thought he was at a wedding. It was that, that amazing. And we heard this about Tyndale, too, when he was executed. So that was the end of the quote. So notice again uh, that Mary Tudor, who had ascended the throne, she was a Catholic, and his, here comes uh, uh, Rogers coming out with his Bible, and he criticizes the Pope and the people uh, uh, that it's unbiblical what the Popes are doing and their, the authority where they claim they're infallible. He criticized them. And that caused Mary, who was on the throne, Mary Tudor, 
to arrest him and have him burned alive. So just because he spoke against the Pope, and of course, it all comes, as we saw this in the opening hour of this study of the history of the English Bible, uh, Protestantism is tied to the study of the history of the English Bible. History of the translation of the English Bible is tied to Protestantism. And that was started by Luther and the other reformers like Calvin and Tyndale. And what they did is that they, they criticized, they were, they were, remember Augustinian, uh, Luther was an Augustinian monk. He was a part of the Catholic Church. Uh, so a lot of these guys are. And they criticized the Pope because what they realized is the Pope was doing things that uh, were not biblical, but also the church was ascribing too much power to the Pope. They were saying that the Pope was infallible. He had the final authority, and that's not what the Bible taught. And so, therefore, the apostles and Jesus have the final authority. The Bible has the final authority. And so the Pope was in, running in contrast to what the Bible was teaching, and thus these men, Rogers, Tyndale, guys like that, and Luther, the Reformers, they were against that and spoke out against the excesses of the Pope and the fact that he claimed such authority, which is not biblical. Now, in 1538, Henry VIII ordered that each church was to have in its possession one book of the whole Bible of the largest volume in English. Now, the churches at that time were using Matthew's Bible because it was a large book, which was perfect for pr public reading, while Coverdale's was very small in comparison. So you had Matthew's Bible, which was very big. The churches liked it. It was great. It was perfect for public reading because it was so large in print. While Coverdale's was very small in comparison. Now, King Henry VIII, his edict was enthusiastically received by his subjects to the extent that lay people were reading the Bible aloud to, have, to their fellow believers while the preacher was communicating his sermon. So as I said before, in 1538, Henry VIII, he ordered that each church was to have in its possession one book of the whole Bible of the largest by a, a volume in English. And they were using the Matthews Bible, which was, had very large print. Well, this was the people loved this edict, but the problem is it interrupted services because people were so, in, uh, so uh, enthralled and enamored with reading from the Bible in their own language that they read it aloud while the, pa the pastor was up there teaching. Well, the king would forbid this behavior eight months later. He did a, it was a good thing he did. So he, uh, the exposition of the scripture by the, the, the man behind the pulpit was being interrupted because people were reading the Bible to themselves. They were like, it was the greatest thing since sliced bread. And, and you know, wouldn't, it, wouldn't it be great to have that in America when people had that attitude toward the Bible? Of course, we don't see it that often in our country. Now, Cromwell, we talked about him, who tried to spare Tyndale's life. He's trying to help Tyndale, but he failed in, in, in delivering Tyndale. Cromwell commissioned Miles Coverdale to publish, to publish a new Bible, but it had to be larger than Matthew's because of the king's edict. Thus, it was called the Great Bible because of its enormous size. It was massive. It was huge. Now, the Great Bible was edited by Coverdale, but it was based upon Matthew's Bible. Now, since Coverdale did not know Greek or Hebrew, he simply took Matthew's Bible and revised it and got rid of the notes. Remember, Matthew's Bible had very controversial notes, 2,000 notes, and one of the, you know, we had the, the, the wife-beating uh, um, um, Pro, uh, uh, problem uh, misprinting there, and that caused the great furor. It was called the White Beater's uh, Bible. So we see that Coverdale uh, came along, and he uh, basically edited Matthew's Bible. It was the Great Bible, it was called, because of its enormous size. And since Coverdale did not know Greek or Hebrew, what he did is he simply took Matthew's Bible, and he revised it and got rid of Matthew's notes. And consequently, it became the second edition of Tyndale, after Matthew's Bible. So as I said before, Tyndale's translation was continuing to be used as we go into hit, uh, further down the line. Uh, it was being used with this great Bible. So we see that the second revision of Tyndale, uh, we see that the great Bible was the second revision, we could call it, of Tyndale's translation after Matthew's Bible. So you have Tyndale, Matthew's Bible, the great Bible. They're all Tyndale. And influence. Now, many bishops who were still Roman Catholic were outraged that this Bible separated the Apocrypha from the rest of the Old Testament and because it was not based upon the Latin Vulgate. And uh, this is interesting. 
throughout history, and even into modern history, anytime you have a new translation, people get weird. People start saying, oh, you're messing with the Bible and all that. It, it, this was all the way up to the, the, the this translations, as we'll see with a revised version of the New American Standard Version. Uh, there was all kinds of flack when the NIV came out, and there were all kinds of criticism for them. And so th this is not unusual. Even the King James received criticism when it came out. What we see is that people are so used to tradition and uh, so, so used to certain things that when you give them a little bit of change or say something that's outside of what they're used to, they get all worked up and they start uh, making accusations and basically not based upon factual evidence. And so we see here that many bishops at the time of the great Bible came out who were still Roman Catholic, they were outraged that this Bible separated the Apocrypha from the, Apocrypha from the rest of the Old Testament, and well, it should be separated from it. And also, they didn't like this translation of the Great Bible because it was not based on the Latin Vulgate. Now, that's ridiculous. And, uh, you know, it's interesting. I mentioned this Thursday night. You think about that. Uh, Wycliffe's translation was based on the Latin Vulgate. Well, the problem with that is that that's not the original languages, first of all, the Hebrew and the Greek are, but it's, there's a big problem with a definite article in Greek and Hebrew. Latin doesn't use an article. So that's, you're going to miss a whole bunch of things about the Bible not interpreting and translating this, the definite article in Hebrew and Greek. So the Latin could do that. So to translate it, to give an English translation based upon the Latin Vulgate, was very literal, wooden, and it was not very accurate. So we, you should be translating off the original the Hebrew and Greek. So here we have these bishops, many of them were Roman Catholic. They were, having a, they were taking a bird over the fact that they were, this great Bible was translated from, not from the Latin Vulgate. And uh, so the reason why is tradition. The Latin Vulgate, remember, uh, in 400 AD was produced by Jerome. It was a great translation to the Latin but the problem is, uh, you know, it lasted for over a thousand years. Great influence. In fact, uh, up to the, uh, I think in the early 60s when I was born, they were reading the, reading the Latin Vulgate uh, from, in the Catholic Mass. I remember my parents, I, I was, it, was, it had changed by the time I was a kid. They, they, my parents were telling me that they, uh, they read the, they did the Mass, you know, like a, a, uh, they'd have the service, and they'd read in Latin the priests. And I said, well, you couldn't understand what he was saying unless you knew Latin. I said, that's stupid. And so they, they changed that, I think, in the 60s, and then they, they had the Mass in English. But prior to that, in the you know, 50s and back, they used the Latin. So if you didn't know Latin, you were up the creek without a paddle. So it, we have all these kind of things going on with the great Bible, this criticism of it, because it was not translated from the Latin Vulgate, and it, didn't, and it put the Apocrypha it separated the Apocrypha from the rest of the Old Testament. And, well, it should. It wasn't considered by the church to be inspired by God. Now, during the reign, during the end of the reign of Henry VIII, which was very tumultuous, during the end of the reign of Henry VIII, Parliament in 1543 forbid any public unauthorized exposition of Scripture as well as all private reading of the Bible among the lower classes. Let me repeat that. During the end of the reign of Henry VIII, Parliament in 1543 forbid any public unauthorized exposition of Scripture, which is what I'm doing right now, as well as all private reading of the Bible among the lower classes. So you had a decree in England from the Parliament saying you couldn't even read your Bible privately. Think about that. And you want to know how you want to know why our country was started? You want to why I know they came to America? And, start, and they had the Declaration of Independence, and they wrote the Bill of Rights where they did, and they had the freedom of religion. You want to know why that all came about? Because of what was going on in England. That's why it all came about. You know your history. And this is why our country, that's why our country has freedom of speech and freedom of religion, because they didn't have it at one time over in Europe, because as we see in these study of the history of the English Bible, you didn't have free speech. You didn't, you couldn't, couldn't, you didn't have freedom of religion. Because, and, if, and we know that because if you didn't go by the party line in the state religion, or you didn't abide by the Catholic Church, they execute you. Even to translate the Bible. So 
This is what we have yet. This get, now, hopefully, this gives you an appreciation of what you and I have. We, you know, we don't have uh, this problem. And the reason why is we, uh, many men and, uh, that uh, went through these things in Europe, they learned the lesson when they started this country. They made sure that this would never happen in America. But unfortunately, I think it might eventually happen in America because they're trying to take away our freedoms. They're trying to take away our freedoms uh, every day from us. And, and, and every time we have a 911, we lose more and more freedoms. And when we lose freedom of religion and we lose freedom of, uh, of speech, uh, which, by the way, I believe what's going on now with this political correctness is basically uh, you're losing your freedom of speech is what's going on. Uh, the media is seeing to that. You can't, if you say anything that you, did, you don't like somebody or this, that, or the other thing, or you don't speak in a way that they, some, the, the political correct crowd, the political, the word police, uh, if you don't say what they want to say and say it the, the way you, you want, they want you to say it, you're, you're ostracized, you're ridiculed, and you're attacked. So the, where our country, is, is, our country is going now the opposite direction, away from freedom of speech, away from freedom of religion. I... Uh, uh, we were talking to uh, Tyler the other day, and when they say they, they did a little a survey of the kids in the class, and what half of them said they should get rid, rid of the freedom of religion, right? And some say uh, freedom of, what are the other one? Free, the guns, right? Right to bear arms, is that what they said? No, just the freedom of religion thing. And what was the other choice that they had? Do you remember? Uh, and that's interesting. They asked the kids, of the five, what, which five that you would get rid of in the Bill of Rights? Keep. And what five you would keep in the Bill of Rights? And, but that's implying we're not going to keep the other ones. Right? See, you're not seeing that. You know why they're doing that? They're doing surveys is what they're doing. They're using you kids to do this stuff. What they're going to basically want to do, they want to see what the public opinion poll, because when they take it away, we're going to see how much they can get away with. So freedom of religion, they're saying, they're saying it's in the top five, get rid of that. Well, this is the youth, this is the young people of Tyler's generation, right? Get rid of it. That's what his generation thinks about freedom of religion. They have no clue what's going on. And pray for these kids because they're learning it from these liberal nuts who are co communists and, uh, and uh, what do you call it, socialists, and who have no appreciation for, the free, uh, for our country and how it started. So this is, now, this is what we had, the, all these guys who were, who gave their lives like Tyndale and the Lollards, they didn't have freedom of speech. They didn't have freedom of religion over in Europe. They left, many people left Europe and started this country because you could get freedom of religion. You could have, you had rights. You had freedom of worship, wherever you want. You had freedom of speech, uh, freedom of the press. Uh, you know, the right to bear arms. You know, all those things is, you know, that's how tyrants, they take away those freedoms and you have tyrants. You know, the king of England had become a tyrant. They tried to escape the tyranny of England. So what we see here is that during the end of the reign of Henry VIII, Parliament in 1543 forbid any public unauthorized exposition of Scripture as well as all private reading of the Bible among the lower classes. Three years later, the king outdid Parliament by banning all copies of Tyndale and Coverdale. He ban banning all copies of Tyndale and Coverdale. Why do you think this was going on? Power. What was happening is the power, you know, we're going to read a quote from uh, somebody. Uh, it might be tomorrow night uh, it's on the King James. But you know that, that, that uh, in Exodus where the Hebrew midwives basically said no to Pharaoh's edict to, to kill the, the little Hebrew baby boys, right, with Moses? Well, one of the kings of England didn't like that. He didn't like that in the Bible. You know why? Because it was telling the people, you can rebel against my authority if I go against God. You see what, it's, what I'm saying here? This is what's going on. Why were these, why were the, the, these houses, these great, uh, these kings in Europe, like in England, why were they so concerned about the translation of the Bible? Because they understood the power of religion. They understood about this. They understood it was very powerful. And if you let the Bible, and they knew what the Bible said about authority, when the authority is telling you to disobey God and not teach the gospel, 
or translate the Bible that you can, you are justified in saying like Daniel did and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and the Hebrew midwives it's your, and the apostles when they told them not to preach the gospel, you have every right and you're justified to say yes to God and no to the rulers when they tell you, when, when they tell you is in conflict, conflicting with the Bible. If they're telling you to disobey God, it's justified civil disobedience. The kings of England, they didn't want this this Bible translated, because it would undermine their absolute tyranny, their absolute power of the people. And the people's eyes would be open. Boy, God says we can go against the king when the king's not, you know, when the king's going against what God says, you know? So this is, this is what power is at issue, power over the people, and these getting the Bible out to the people and the lower classes, they were afraid of a big uprising against the, against the king. So... We see that uh, the Reformation was back in full throttle when the son of Henry VIII, Edward VI, became king. However, his reign didn't last long, and in 1553, Mary Tudor, who was Edward's sister, who I mentioned before, came to the throne. Bloody Mary was her nickname. She promptly reversed Edward's Pro Protestant leanings by returning the country to Catholicism. So her brother leaned toward the Protestants, and but Mary leaned toward Catholicism. She did. She uh, he, she basically reversed Edward the Sixth policies, which were sympathetic to Protestantism, and she systematically burned both Bibles and Protestants. She burned both Bibles and Protestants. Many Protestant scholars fled England to Geneva as a result of Mary's actions. Now Geneva was a great place at that time because. The, one of the greatest Bible teachers in the history of the church, and his influence is still felt today in modern times, John Calvin was teaching there. John Calvin ex did, uh, institute, he had a great, uh, uh, a great uh, systematic theology uh, institutes of the Christian religion. Uh, he also uh, did exposition on, I think, every book in the Bible. He taught in Geneva, and he was, he was a great man. And it was here, Geneva, that these Protestant English scholars produced a magnificent translation of the Bible. Calvin's brother-in-law, William Whittingham was his name, was one of these English scholars. He completed his translation of the New Testament in 1557. He and other English scholars and reformers worked on the entire Bible. And in 1560, they produced a translation of the Old Testament and a revised New Testament. Now, this leads us to the Geneva Bible. We go from the Great Bible, so we've seen to this evening, uh, we have Coverdale's Bible, and then we have Matthew's Bible, then the Great Bible, and then we have the, the Geneva Bible, which I showed you, the kids earlier in Titus. Uh, it's quite fascinating to look at the English, uh, how uh, different it, it was back then. The uh, Geneva Bible is quite an interesting Bible as well. A quite interesting story behind it as well. The production of the G Geneva Bible was a significant accomplishment because it was the first English Bible translated entirely from the original Greek and Hebrew text. Remember, you had English Bibles translated from the Latin Vulgate or just the New Testament uh, with Tyndale. He didn't have the Old Testament completed. So this was the first, the Geneva Bible was a significant accomplishment for translators, since it was the first English Bible that was translated entirely from the original languages of Scripture, Hebrew Old Testament and Aramaic, and the Greek New Testament. Also, it's interesting, it was the first Bible which was done by a committee and not just one individual. And the King James, as we'll note tomorrow, was done by committee as well. In fact, most translations are done by committee today. In fact, and nearly almost, I, I think there is, obviously there's some that, you know, have, or individuals have done these, tran have done translations, but pretty much the ESV, the NIV, today's NIV, the Net Bible, they're all done by committee. And that's a good way to do it as long, as long as the committee is not too big. Because what hap we'll talk about why that's a problem when we uh, uh, study the last hour of this uh, subject of the history of the English Bible. So it's a good idea uh, for the, a committee to a, a committee to do the translation, uh, because it, more than one, it's good to have one more head, one more one or more scholar to do it. Not everybody is. Uh, of course, you have a guy like Tyndale, who is extraordinary, and he did a great translation on his own. So it can be done. 
uh, depends upon the man, but usually Tyndales don't come, around, come along and Jeromes don't come along very often. Remember, Jerome did his Latin Vulgate, uh, Latin translation of the Bible by himself, but it's a good idea that, uh, like the modern translations, they all do it by committee, and that's the I think that's a good way to do it. So it, we see here that the Geneva Bible was an, basically another revision of Tyndale's work. Uh, it was based upon Tyndale's work, and thus can be properly considered as the third revision of Tan Tyndale's translation of the Bible. So I've been mentioning this about tran Tyndale's influence, his translation, because pretty much uh, we see the, the Bibles we've mentioned this evening, they're all revisions of Tyndale. And the King James is too. It's basically another revision of Tyndale. And that tells you the great influence of Tyndale. And it, it extended right up to modern times. So we see that uh, the notes of the Geneva Bible were greatly influenced by the teaching of John Calvin. And it was the first uh, English Bible with verse divisions, which were in relation to the New Testament, uh, which, in, which were in relation to the New Testament, influenced by Stephanus's fourth edition of the Greek New Testament, which appeared in 1551 and was the first Greek New Testament with verse division. So I've talked about this in the past. Uh, the original languages of Scripture, uh, you don't have chapter 1, chapter 2. You don't have verse markings, verse 1, 2, 3. You know, you hear in uh, Hebrews where they say, the, uh, the writer of Hebrews, who I think is Paul, says somewhere in the Psalms or somewhere in the... Pro Basically, because you didn't have chapter divisions and verse markings. Well, what happened is the first, the first Bible that actually did this was the Geneva Bible, the first English Bible translation. However, the, it was the Greek New Testament of Stephanus in 1551, which was the first Bible of any kind, whether it was an English translation or a Greek New Testament or whatever. That's the first one that had verse markings, verse divisions, and chapter divisions. Was uh, was Stephanus' Greek New Testament in 1551. And the Geneva Bible came along, and it was the first English translation with these verse division, chapter divisions, which is a great idea, because you can find stuff. It was a, some people say, this is, I don't know how true this is, but Stephanus had this idea, and he did the chapter divisions, the verse divisions, on horseback. I, I, don't, know, I, I don't know if that's true or what it is. Uh, it could be just legend. I don't know. You never know. It's truth is a uh, reality is stranger than fiction sometimes. So maybe that's true. But Stephanus was the guy who it's attributed to these verse divisions. Now, the Geneva Bible also was the first English Bible to use italics extensively for words that which were, which were not in the original text. Uh, we mentioned this before. This is in other Bibles, but it wasn't used extensively. The New American Standard. Uh, they put a word in italics. It's telling you this word does not translate a word in the original text. Uh, they, many times they, they, they put it in there because it makes the smoother translation in English. If you didn't have it there, it would sound funny. So the Geneva Bible was the first English Bible to use italics extensively. And notice how I emphasize that. For It was used extensively, the italics, for words that were not in the original text. Interestingly... It was the Bible that the pilgrims uh, took with them when they came to America and landed in Plymouth. And it was also the first the Bible that Shakespeare used. So this Geneva Bible, which I have here in front of me, and I wish I could do a close-up shot with a video, but we don't have that capability. But uh, we see that uh, it's quite interesting. It was the Bible of the pilgrims, and it was also the Bible that Shakespeare used. Shakespeare knew his Bible, if you, if you haven't read Shakespeare. He's, I think if every kid should read Shakespeare. Read all the works of Shakespeare. It's great stuff. And uh, I always liked the, the, you know, Julius Caesar. I thought that was always good. But uh, we see that this Bible, the Geneva Bible, is very famous and it was very influential, especially in the start of this country. The pilgrims used it, and of course Shakespeare used it as well, the Geneva Bible. The print of the Geneva Bible was very small since it was produced originally only in quarto size because it was produced in Europe and shipped back to England. Now, what we show, what I showed you guys, it's you know it looks pretty small. I think it was actually it might be even smaller than how it's printed in this bio here. So uh, the reason why that was is because it was produced in Europe and was shipped back to America is why they and they wanted to have a bunch of these. So the uh, the Geneva Bible 
and we'll, we'll see the, this Bible tomorrow, the King James, the Geneva Bible actually very seriously influenced uh, the translation of the King James Bible. Now, it is also, the Geneva Bible was also nicknamed the Britches Bible. Uh, britches, is anybody remember what britches means? Uh, old people know, like myself, and Alice probably knows what britches means. Britches, mean, we used to call them pants. Your pants, is, we call them britches. Put your britches on. You know, you got a hole in your britches. You know, that's, how they used to, that's what they used to call pants, britches. So the Geneva Bible was called the britches Bible by many people because at Gen Genesis 3, 7, Adam and Eve are said to sew fig leaves together, and they made themselves into britches. So, so basically, it was like saying, oh, they were, they were making pants for themselves or something, so to cover up their genitals. But uh, that's what it was called. It was also called the Wicked Bible. The Geneva Bible was also called the Wicked Bible. Not because the, now, by the way, the translators weren't doing these, you know, uh, when, I, when I mentioned the era of, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the, the wife beater's Bible there, remember, that was a printing era. Okay, they made a, a mistake in the printing. Now, this Bible, the Geneva Bible, not only was called the Britches Bible, because it, what it says in Genesis 3, 7, but also it's called the Wicked Bible because, it, unfortunately, the printers, they made a mistake and they left out the knot in the seventh commandment in Exodus 20, 14, which prohibited idolatry. So, so that's why they call it the Wicked Bible because it was basically saying, Pro, thou shall commit adultery because it didn't put the knot in there. So it was... Quite interesting when that happened. The printers really got a lot of, load of grief from the translators, I'm sure. Now, during the 45-year reign, reign of uh, Queen Elizabeth, nearly 100 editions of the Geneva Bible were published. It was still the most... This is interesting. The Geneva Bible was still the most popular Bible in England even 50 years after the King James was published. The King James, pretty much like a lot of translations, even modern translations wasn't readily accepted by people. The Geneva Bible was still the Bible people liked better than the King James. And this was 50 years into the existence of the King James. So the Geneva Bible was still the most popular Bible in England, even 50 years after the King James Bible was published. Its reign, Geneva's, the Geneva Bible's reign in England, would come to an end because a new king would want his own translation that was devoid of Calvin's influence. Now, as I said before... Remember the Geneva Bible, Calvin, who was in Geneva teaching, he was a huge theologian, scholar, great expositor of the scriptures. Uh, even today, he's looked upon with reverence and still, uh, and still uh, uh, what he wrote is still considered by many scholars today as a... Uh, 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 can, to be used, it can be used today. It's still appropriate to use his material. He 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 uh, he, he doesn't get bad with age. He still he still is uh, relevant. Uh, Calvin, but Calvin, his he, basically the notes in the Geneva Bible were influenced by Calvin, and the King of England comes on a new King of England comes on the scene. He doesn't like Calvinism. He doesn't like Calvin, and he wants the notes out that the Geneva Bible had. The next Bible, he wanted those notes out that were influenced by Calvin's teaching. Now, the Bishop's Bible is what this Bible was called. The Bishop's Bible was published in 1568. It was based upon the Great Bible, but was a pulpit Bible. Thus, it can be considered the fourth revision of Tyndale's translation. So again, I'm trying to point out Tyndale's influence. This Bishop's Bible was actually the fourth revision of Tyndale's translation. So this Bible, the Bishop's Bible, how did it receive its name? It received its name because it was produced by bishops. And uh, it was not a very good translation because it was too wooden, meaning it was too literal, and that it did not reflect the sense of the original. So it, it never was well received by the people, the common people, and even the Queen of England rejected it as well. Its last printing was in 1606. And amazingly and ironically, this translation, which was inferior to the Geneva Bible, became the official base that the King James translators were ordered to use in making their version. Of course, they didn't always adhere to what the king wanted, as we'll see when we study the King James translation. So the bishop's Bible comes on the scene, and the king wants something different because he doesn't like, he doesn't like the Geneva Bible because it has Calvin's notes, and Calvin's notes are not, uh, you know, it's not going to help him any in his power, maintaining his power and extending his power. So he wants Calvin, uh, influence of Calvin out of the Bible. 
And so he gets this bishop's Bible together, but the people never catch on to it. They don't like it. They still cling to the Geneva Bible. Then Elizabeth succeeded Bloody Mary, and she was a Protestant. So remember Mary Tudor, she killed a lot of Protestants, burned them, executed them, uh, burned a lot of Bibles. All right? Then Elizabeth comes along. She succeeds Bloody Mary, and she, Elizabeth, is a Protestant. This resulted in Catholic scholars fleeing the country. She killed Catholics just as Mary killed Protestants. And you want to know why? There's Catholics and Protestant problems over in Europe. It goes all the way back there, boys and girls, with these people killing each other off. So all over religion, of course. And again, that's, you know, religion has started pretty much most of the, a lot of the wars that have happened in the history. And I'm not saying biblical Christianity is at fault. I'm saying religion. It's the, the, the devil's ace trump. He uses religion to control people. When I say religion, I'm talking in, con, in, in, in distinct, uh, uh, contrast to biblical Christianity. Notice I say biblical Christianity. So we see that Elizabeth, like Mary, Tudor, she kills, and she kills the other side. She killed Catholics just as Mary killed Protestants. So both sides were uh, out of their minds. Now the Catholic hierarchy, they wanted their own English translation but not because they agreed that the lay people should read the Bible. So here we have the situation. Who's translating the Bible? The Protestants are. They're making all these translations into English. And there were other translations throughout Europe, and Spanish and German, of course. Luther had his translation in German. He had translations all over Europe in everybody's language. And so the Catholics said, you know, we need to get to going here. We've got to get an English translation ourselves because we just have the Latin Vulgate. Now, their reason for putting out a translation in English was not to, to, for the lay people to, to get to know God and his word, but they wanted things their way. They wanted their own Bible, quote unquote, because they wanted people, they're going to read the Catholics, our, the Catholic Church is going to read an English translation. It's not going to be one of those Protestant Bibles. Who, who, and those Protestants, they don't like us, those reformers, they don't like the Catholic Church. We want to have our own English translation so we won't have this, so we can, uh, uh, our people can read what we want them to read, so, which is quite interesting. So the Catholic hierarchy wanted their own English translation, but not because they agreed that lay people should read the Bible. Rather, they wanted a translation which reflected their religious views so as to control their parishioners. Now, the preface of this version made clear that the readership uh, was, to, it was intended to be priests and other dignitaries. Now, the name of this Bible is called the Rames Douay Bible. Rames Douay Bible, R H uh, R H uh, E I M S, and then, there's a, then we have the next word, Douay, which is D O U A I. Rames Douay Bible, and that was the Catholic Bible. The preface of this version made clear that the readership was intended to be priests and other dignitaries. So that means the Catholic Church didn't want the, the lay people, their parishioners, reading the Bible. And I, I like to tell this story. Um, when I was raised a Roman Catholic, and I used to say, why can't you read the Bible? Well, you can understand it without, you know, the, you can't understand it anyways. What do you mean that? I can't understand it. Is it in, can I get it in English? Yeah. But what do you mean I can't understand it? Can I make the decision if I can't understand it or whatever? So then they're like, you know, and, and then they said, uh, well, you, need, you couldn't understand it without a priest or something like that, you know. And I was like, really? That's interesting. And then I started running into some friends who weren't Catholics, and they were saying, that's a bunch of baloney, Bill. You can read the Bible. You can go pick it up. Go pick up a Bible and read it. What are you, you're not going to, you know. And they were evangelizing me also in the process. And uh, they were a bunch of rebels themselves. It was great. And, uh, and I ended up being a, a Christian. And I, you know, I remember picking up the King James, you know, this, this is old English. I didn't, I, nobody didn't tell me about the NIV or anything like that. My mother had a good news Bible somewhere, which actually is pretty good translation. And uh, so, uh, you know, all of a sudden, it was like, oh, you know, and I got saved, and I was like, now I had the gift of the Spirit. I was like, oh, the, what are you talking about? You can't understand the Bible. <laughs> I was like, so and I remember I was like the first one in my family to ever break from the Catholic Church. I'll tell you what. It was, uh, was bizarre because uh, my father, he could care. I don't, I don't think he really cared one way or the other. I know that. But he wanted to keep my mother happy. And my mother was like, you know, it, basically they thought it was like, oh, we did something wrong here. My mother, you know, because he's leaving the Catholic Church. And all my cousins, it's, this is so funny. Of all my Catholic, uh, all my, uh, my family, you know, my cousins, my mother's side, my father's side, 
I was the first, I know I was the first one to leave the Catholic Church. And it took a lot of courage because they were just, you know, my mother was like, you know, tr- you know laying on, you know, the, the family, was, family members was laying guilt trips on me. And I was like, you know, not going, you know, not doing Lent anymore. You know, on Friday you had to eat fish. And I was like, I'm having, I'd go home, I'd come home and I'd just go get a steak and cheese and I'd go right in front of my mother because I, I shouldn't have done that. And I don't suggest to do, I shouldn't have done that because that was the wrong way to handle it. But I was an immature Christian. I was like showing, hey, is, you know, I'm eating a steak and cheese. Mm-mm-mm, it's on Friday. Oh, you're going to go to hell. Oh, you know. No, it was all, so I just, just was like, you know, so here I am. And then it's so funny. Uh, you know, then, you know, I, I, the other, I, I found out since, you know, here's like 30 years later, I have, I have cousins I never knew who became born again and saved and <laughs> in Bible teach, Bible listening to the study of the Bible. You know, I have a family member, you know, I have a nephew, I have a, uh, a brother who, who's born again, I know for sure. And, you know, so they, they all left the Catholic Church. So it's like, you know, some, I have cousins now who I know I didn't know that had happened. But I remember, I, was the, I know I was the first one that left. I knew there was nobody, because that was a big deal when I left. You know, I said, I'm not going to church anymore when I was 18 or 19. That created a big fear. It went right through my, the whole family. That like, oh, Billy's, you know, he's, you know, he's who knows what he's into now, you know. So, anyways, uh, just I bring that in because you know I can. Uh, I'm trying to bring out this whole thing about lay people in the Catholic Church. Parishioners were discouraged from reading the Bible. And I bring that up because I know for firsthand that's what was told us when we were kids. You know, you can't understand it. You know, priests need to help you on that. Well, let me. Why doesn't the priest talk about it? You know, I was like. Because it was all this kind of this garbage, and uh, you know, uh, so I'm, I bring that relate that personal point of my in my past because uh, I could, uh, it, it, it spoke to this point I just made made a few moments ago. Now, lay people again were discouraged from reading the Bible, but if they were going to read a Bible, the Catholic Church wanted these people, their people, the parishioners, the Roman Catholics, to read their Bible. The the priests. The dignitaries, the Pope, he wanted them to read this Rames Douay Bible because it was quote unquote their Bible. So the Rame, as we close here, the Rames Douay Bible was not based upon the original Greek and Hebrew text. Of course it wouldn't, but rather it was based upon the Latin Vulgate, which is the case with all Catholic Bibles until <coughs> excuse me, the mid 20th century. So remember, Catholic Bibles up to the mid 20th century, they were they were based on the Latin Vulgate. Why is that? Why didn't they translate from the original Hebrew and Greek? Because the Latin Vulgate was the translation that the Roman Catholic Church had from 400 AD when it was first commissioned by Pope Damasus and Jerome. He, uh, Jerome, he told Jerome, I want this translation. So he, they put it into Latin. And Latin was the language of Europe for a long time, the Holy Roman Empire. And you know, then we had things change with, with Luther and the Reformers and Tyndale and the translators, the Protestants, that all started, to, you know, things started to change. And then, you know, but the, so the Catholics eventually, <laughs> it took them all the way to the 20th century to start come up with their own translation that's based upon the original Hebrew and Greek. That's how powerful the Latin Vulgate was. The Latin Vulgate of any translation in history, whether it's English, whatever language, the Latin Vulgate is the most influential and is, and, uh, is a more powerful translation for, for centuries. For over a thousand years, it was used. It's still being read. I had a Latin Vulgate at home on my computer program. But that's, and that's not a knock on the Latin Vulgate uh, because it was a great translation of it at its time. But it's, you know, unless you're a Latin-speaking person, Latin's a dead language. I took two years of Latin. And I, don't, I don't know why I took two years of Latin. Uh, aced them both. But, uh, you know, I think that's why I wanted to be a writer. So I figured I'll take up Latin, some languages and stuff. So anyways... The, uh, the Rames Douay Bible was not based upon the original Greek and Hebrew text, but rather was based upon the Latin Vulgate, which is the case with all Catholic Bibles, until the mid-20th century. Now, this was the direct result of the Council of Trent in 1544, which decreed that Bibles should be translated from the Latin. That's what the Catholic Church decreed in 1544, of the Council of Trent, that if you're going to have an English translation, it's got to be based upon the Latin Vulgate, basically our, our Bible. <laughs> now, Vatican II has since rescinded that order. Therefore, from our study, as we close here, from our study we see the last three evenings, we can see that the first era of the English Bible translation occurred from 1382 to 1610. 1382 to 1610 gives us 230 years, nearly 230 years 
of translating the Bible into English. This is the first era that we, uh, we see. Tomorrow, we'll note the second era. Now, uh, Dr. Dan Wallace, who is a great New Testament scholar, textual critic, uh, he's an excellent, excellent theologian as well. Dan Wallace writes the following. I'm quoting from him. Speaking of this first era of English Bible translation from 1382 to 1610, he says it was a period marked by two things. On the one hand, by a profound concern that every Christian have access to God's revealed will in the Bible. On the other hand, the church hierarchy suppressed this effort first by killing the translators and burning their Bibles. And when that failed, an authorized, quote-unquote, translation was made that tried to stem the tide of the Protestant heresy. And tomorrow evening, we're going to study the, continue our study of the history of the English Bible going into our fourth hour. We're going to note the era of the King James. So I think you'll find that quite interesting. So let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for this study uh, that we had this evening. We pray that this study will be a blessing to your people and give them a greater appreciation of the Bibles that they have, the English translations that they have in front of them. In our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.